All right, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, today's lecture is in honor of uh, Dr. Gil Blount uh, and Peter Buttrick, the uh, head of the Division of Cardiology will say some uh, introductory comments. Peter. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this lecture is annually a great pleasure. It's a lecture that's uh, named in honor of Gil. Oh, your audio audio went out. Yeah, I saw that. Am I okay. back? Yeah, you You're are. Back. Yeah, Gil was the founding division head um, of the Division of Cardiology um, and um, one of the most influential cardiologists um, in Colorado. Uh, we are fortunate um, that a number of his trainees support and attend uh, this <clears throat> lecture uh, annually. Um, and we, um, it's, it's a very great honor for us to uh, acknowledge his memory, his contributions to the division and the institution. Um, and um, our speaker uh, today is a very good friend of mine. It's probably good that I don't introduce her because I will tell embarrassing stories from her past. Um, so I'm going to turn over the introduction of the speaker uh, to Dr. Albert. Okay. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth McNally. She did her undergrad uh, at Barnard, uh, where she graduated cum laude. She got a master's and MD degree at, Al at Einstein, where she graduated AOA, and subsequently did a PhD at Albert Einstein uh, with Leslie Linewan uh, prior to her move to Colorado. Um, Dr. McNally did her residency in cardiology fellowship at the Brigham, and she was a research fellow at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in Boston Children's during that time. Uh, she joined the faculty in cardiology at the University of Chicago and became the A.J. Carlson Professor and Director of the Institute for Cardiovascular Research. In 2014, she moved to the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern as a professor of medicine, biochemistry, and molecular genetics, and was named the Elizabeth J. Ward Chair and Director for the Center of Genetic Medicine at Northwestern. Uh, in 2020, she became the director of the Starzl Academy at Feinberg. Uh, that is an academy that's designed to develop uh, physician scientists, an increasingly important uh, undertaking these days. Dr. McNally has numerous honors that I won't go through, but she's been elected to both ASCI and AAP and has been president of both organizations. She's also a distinguished clinical scientist for the Doris Duke Foundation. Been on the editorial boards of Circulation, Circulation Research, Journal of Bio Biological Chemistry and the JCI and others. She has a study section representation from NIH and the American Heart Association. Her research interests are the cardiovascular complications of neuromuscular disease, cardiomyopathies, and inherited aortopathy uh, and uh, arrhythmia syndromes. Uh, she's extremely well-funded, has, uh, by my reading, 10 current uh, grants, including being PI on three R01s and co-PI on a fourth. Uh, numerous publications. We're really looking forward to uh, your talk. Uh, thanks for coming, Dr. McNally. Great. Thank you. And um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And so I just to put this in a little bit of perspective, I normally like to talk about genetics um, and in particular cardiac genetics, since that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Um, but, you know, especially in these last few years, there's been a lot of focus on um, many of the wonderful things that we can learn by looking at genetic ancestry. And then I think especially in this last year, the intersections between ancestry and race have become increasingly important. And so I thought I'd touch upon that today as well. And so uh, just some of my disclosures, I do work with a number of companies because Thankfully, there's actually a lot of interest in developing new therapeutics for rare diseases these days, um, but that's not going to be the content of my talk today. So these activities are unrelated to the talk. 
So I was asked to start with some cases, which I normally do like to do. And I always like to reach to cases that were from, you know, last week or the week before. So here's uh, one example of a case, and we'll come back to these at the end. So this is a 56-year-old woman who we I was evaluating in clinic. And she came to our attention because her daughter had died of sudden cardiac death in her 20s uh, the year before. And uh, a post-mortem testing that was done in the daughter showed a tightened truncating variant. And so TTN is Titan, and it's a premature truncation at position 24,226. Titan's a very long, long protein. Um, and then through what we call cascade testing, this patient, the one I was seeing in clinic, was also found to carry this same Titan likely pathogenic variant. And so I evaluated her looking at her EKG, ordered an MRI and some other testing, and a lot of that's still pending at this point in time. And then a second case um, is a 62-year-old male who has a long history of conduction system disease, as you can see from his EKG, which is paste. Um, so he had a lot of problem with sinus pauses, uh, paroxysmal atrial flutter, high-grade AV block. And then importantly, in the background, he's had a lot of non-sustained VT. Um, he underwent genetic testing, and what I'm showing you in the middle is just a uh, download from his uh, device, which is just a pacemaker, not an ICD, and you see he has a lot of VT events, a lot of non-sustained VT. He underwent genetic testing and was found to have an RBM20, what's called a variant of uncertain significance. This is the position, and this data just says it's extremely rare in the in the um, general population, and also in the European population, he was of European ancestry. Um, and so with that, those are the two cases to think about, and we'll come back to them at the end. Um, there's really two broad ways to think about genetic variation as it exists in humans. There are what we call rare variants. These are what are responsible for the rare diseases. They're overall very rare in the population, like what I just showed you for that RBM20 variant. But when they're found in individuals, they have a particularly large effect size. And so these are the kind of things we do genetic testing for. We run gene panels. When we identify them, um, they're very important in the family. And then there are common variants, which uh, these are at much higher population frequency. They have small effect size, but when summed together, they may have a larger effect size. This is the type of genetic variant that is looked for in genome-wide association studies, um, and then increasingly in polygenic risk scores. Um, and so when we approach genetic testing these days, what's become more mainstay, particularly in some of our for some of our cardiovascular diseases, we are doing gene panel testing, which is looking for rare variants. And to get at these rare variants, you have to do uh, complete sequencing of the coding region of genes and even a little bit of the flanking regions. This pulls out the rare genetic variants. We routinely do gene panel testing for all our cardiomyopathies, long QT syndrome. Um, I do a lot of neuromuscular diseases. All of my patients have to be genetically diagnosed so I know what their cardiac risk risks are, and then in the aortopathies. Um, and then in some settings, we may move on to more comprehensive genetic testing that involves doing an exome or a genome or in combination with RNA sequencing. Um, sometimes we're doing trio exomes of parents if it's a younger patient. Um, and so there are many different approaches that we use. Um, when we look at these genetic variants, what we do is we score them across the spectrum. They're either considered benign or likely benign. And the major driver of whether a genetic variant is considered benign or likely benign has to do with its population frequency. Um, at the other end of the spectrum are the likely pathogenics and the pathogenics. Um, and this is determined by being rare in the population. We also determine this by what is the effect that that variant makes on the protein it's encoding, and then sometimes its ability to segregate with, uh, within a family if there are multiple affected family members. But in the middle are these variants of uncertain significance, which simply is that these are not to be considered benign, nor are they considered pathogenic. They simply sit in the middle. They are typically very rare variants, and we just simply don't have enough information to say whether they're pathogenic or likely pathogenic. And as a clinician, I can tell you a lot of times I get results that are variant of uncertain significance. And I can interpret that better than the testing company can because I have the benefit of all the clinical data from the patient and their family in front of me. And I can use that to sometimes look at a variant of uncertain significance and determine that I think it's more on the benign spectrum or that in fact, it's the likely pathogenic. 
And I would tell you in the last year, um, one of the companies we order testing with a lot have, have reconsidered a lot of their variants and have returned to us now probably a half a dozen variants that we previously told the patients were likely pathogenic and only now has the company started to upgrade those to be considered likely pathogenic. So as the clinician, you have the right to overinterpret the test that comes in front of you because you have more information. So how these variants are actually scored as being pathogenic is driven by these guidelines, which are from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics or the ACMG. Um, and it uses a scoring system where points are awarded for these different criteria and it adds up to a certain number of points and that's how it gets scored that way. Um, and so when we look at what's actually driving these scores, and again, they're based on predicted probabilities, the pathogenic criteria, which are considered strong or even very strong, are based on having really good knowledge about what the prevalence of a disease is in the general population. And I'd like to point out that for many of our cardiovascular disorders, we don't always know the prevalence. Um, we don't do routine screening for aortic disease, nor do we do routine screening for cardiomyopathy. We wait until patients come to us with symptoms by and large or get picked up by some other ways. And so we don't have a good estimate of what the true prevalence of these disorders are, making this a difficult criteria to apply. Um, we also have many variable and mild presentations of our disorders, and I make these points because it's strikingly different for the cancer genomic landscape. So for example, we do do many screening tests for cancer, cancers, particularly breast cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, prostate cancer to some degree as well. And so we have a much better um, sense of what the population prevalence of those are. And, and so this criteria doesn't work for us very well in the cardiovascular state space. On the other hand, we do have a criteria that works for us, which is these loss of function variants, so variants that are very disruptive to the gene and cause loss of function, um, we do find that's helpful. And so this uh, criteria can actually work well for us in this, in this scoring schedule. Um, and then the last piece, again, these are all based on relative probabilities of whether the odds of pathogenicity add up. Um, we do have, again, population data. And this is, again, something that may not work well for us across all genomic diseases or genetic diseases at this point, because what a, a big take home message of this is that, in fact, we do have population data on the frequency of these variants quite well when we're considering individuals of European ancestry. Where it starts to fall apart is when we look at people who are non-European ancestry. And I think all of us would say, well, that's our patients who are in our clinic. We see the broad spectrum of everything in our clinic. And so how is it that we're trying to use this information from European ancestry to apply to these other ancestries where it really doesn't? And so this is a highlight of an area that we have to do better in. Um, and so this started to come uh, draw people's attention um, as much as five years ago when I think there was the hope that as we sequenced more and more people, the first big genomic data sets of looking at how genetic variation looks across groups of diverse individuals really started with the Thousand Genomes Project, which was around 2011. Uh, 2012, we had the exome sequencing project, which was the first broader look. And of course, that's only gone higher and higher over the years. And so I think there was this hope that we were going to remove um, considerations of race because a lot of it would actually be genetic. We could think about it as ancestry and maybe we could get to this better. And I think what we've learned a lot about in this last year is that race is really something extremely distinct from genetic ancestry. Genetic ancestry is something we can measure and get more information about, whereas race is now really encompassing the whole sociobiologic outcomes that an individual um, faces based on certain biological criteria, criteria that are not in fact um, genetic. So we're starting to actually separate these criteria. Um, this year, there's been, in fact, even more focus on this with race and genetic ancestry in medicine and, uh, you know, a strong consideration as how we begin to separate that. I think the easier part of this equation is very much the genetic ancestry piece. Um, we can measure this, we can look at it, we can know frequency, we can approach this in a more um, systematic way. On the other hand, dissecting the social determinants of health that contribute to what we use as a surrogate, calling it race, um, we have a lot more work to do in that. And, and I'm happy that we're starting to see that these really are two different things and that we need to begin to separate those. I hope over time we can really get at the social determinants of health in a way that we can address those things that are, that are most fixable. Um, 
And so with that, just going a little bit about genetic ancestry, um, a reminder, most people I think are familiar with this general concept, but the origins of humanity are, are truly out of Africa. And so the, the really true humans came out of Africa. Uh, there was a migration effort in, in history that brought them through the Middle East and up into Europe. And this European ancestry was really a very small group of individuals uh, admixed with Neanderthal DNA. Um, and then there was a further migration along with some additional migrations um, that then brings us to North America. And so in North America, we have a very diverse set of ancestries that we deal with, which is a, a very interesting, if you're a geneticist, it's really quite interesting because it really lets us see the spectrum of almost the entire world looking just at what we see in the United States. Um, and so to just summarize this part, um, genetic determinants, when we think about genetic ancestry, we're using genetic determinants to assess relatedness among different populations. And over the history of doing this in genetics, it's been done using a variety of different methods just based on how good our sequencing was at the time. So this began with mitochondrial DNA, um, where we could look at mitochondrial genomes, and that was great for looking at matrilineal lineages. Um, and then there was a focus on doing the Y chromosome itself, which just looked at, looked at Y chromosome. Uh, there was an attempt to do this with copy number variation, and this not so successfully. And then where we do this now is looking at single nucleotides, so single base pair polymorphisms as they exist across the human genome. And it's not uncommon to look at millions of these SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms when we actually assess ancestry these days. So we now do this using millions of SNPs. Um, that's the most common that we use right now, but the number of SNPs that you use doing this across the genome and their distribution across the genome influence what results you do. So the deeper the chip, the better result is that you get. We do what's now called a principal components analysis where we cluster those results and we assign people to ancestry groups based on PCs. You hear people say PC1 and PC2 to get at, and sometimes that's taken out to six different principal components to really get at ancestry. Um, but a really important part to recognize in sort of this next area that we'll be looking at with a lot of genetic data is that ancestry is non-uniform across the genome. So especially here in the United States, where we have a really mixed population, um, there may be parts of a genome carrying some certain genes that really derive from a different ancestral background than other parts. And so that's important to think about because that's sort of a, a new area to be looking at. But most importantly, ancestry is not race. Those are separate things. So when I'm talking about ancestry, I'm talking about genetic ancestry. Um, as we do um, genetic testing, uh, this was a paper from, again, five years ago, which really highlighted that we were sometimes identifying genetic variants in patients. Um, and one of the key things out of this paper was looking at genetic determinants for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and identifying what we thought were variants that were causing disease. But um, it turned out when we sequenced enough people of that genetic ancestry, that in fact wasn't causing disease. It was just more represented in that background. And so this was an example where we were genetically over-diagnosing patients, causing some of them to get defibrillators and medical management of things that they didn't really need because this really wasn't the cause of their disease. Um, similarly, these days, what we face much more is a, a problem of genetic underdiagnosis. And so this, again, was a, a nice uh, piece of work from Latrice Landry and Heidi Rehm, where they were looking at um, how often we were unable to provide a diagnosis based on what people's background was. So it, this is, again, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where individuals who are uh, white, and again, interestingly, in genetic testing these days, we often just do what somebody self-reports their race as. So they were a little more likely to have a positive result, um, less likely to have an inconclusive or variant of unsignificant result, and again, a little more likely to have a negative result compared to people that came from more diverse backgrounds, where again, it's just a little bit harder to do that interpretation, in part because the genetic variation is so much greater. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, these days, there's a lot of emphasis on genetic risk scores. Genetic risk scores are looking at that common genetic variation that is derived from genome-wide association studies. Um, and they sum these up to get an additive effect um, and uses an array-based strategy to get at this genetic. So these SNP chips where it's an array of many different single nucleotide polymorphisms. And it's done very similarly to how you would do ancestry testing. 
Um, and part of the problems with doing polygenic risk scores these days is that um, the majority of our genomic data that's been used for genome-wide association studies is disproportionately been done in individuals of European ancestry. So if we are relying on this data to come up with genetic scores that apply to this population, um, we're really not using the right data sets. And so that's been a, a big push these days, which is to figure out um, which of these polygenic risk scores can begin to apply across this broad diversity of patients that, that we see here in America, for example. Um, and this was a, a nice example from uh, 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 Shreya Rao and Amberish Pandey, um, where they started to look at the association of genetic variants specifically linked to West African ancestry and to correlate whether that was actually um, uh, correlating with blood pressure response to therapy, which was what they were looking at. And they broke the groups into tertiles uh, with more or less West African ancestry. And they found that there was basically very little correlation with blood pressure with ancestry suggesting that we should not be over-interpreting the role of genomic ancestry or genetic ancestry in being determinants of blood pressure. Now, I think this is a great paper and a terrific first start, but for example, I will point out that this was based on really a very small number of single nucleotide polymorphisms to identify someone as being of West African ancestry. And so I would love to see more of this being done going forward using a much deeper set of more distributed uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So again, we can begin to address some of that regional variation that exists as we look across genomes. Um, but are we in the position, so I do see a lot of patients with cardiomyopathy and a lot of patients with heart failure, and we do a lot of genetics. And I think what we would hope is that um, the genetic information can help predict who's really going to be better get heart failure. And when we can do that, we can intervene better. Many of our heart failure patients these days we see in the hospital at stage C or even stage D where they require very aggressive therapies for treatment. But what we would really like to be able to do is identify individuals who are at stage A, those individuals who are at high risk, who don't have any symptoms and may not even have an abnormally appearing heart at this point in time. Um, in part because I think we can do much better management for these individuals, if not just by controlling their blood pressure better, I think you would really delay the onset of a lot of these symptoms. Now, there are some clinical predictors, and what I would love to see more of is that we do better genomic predictors to add alongside those clinical predictors. So we know cardiomyopathy is one of the substrates for causing heart failure. And cardiomyopathy, we ascertain by really looking at the heart. So dilated cardiomyopathy, the heart looks enlarged. It has all four chambers enlarged. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, the walls of the heart are thickened, um, and we may see some impaired filling, as well as uh, some increase in, in function, particularly earlier in the disease. Um, and as we think about the genetic contribution for um, heart failure, we really get a whole variety of answers. So if we're looking for common disease variants, there have been a wealth of studies that have pointed to a number of different genes that have been picked up. Um, very few of these are the same genes that we see on the other end of the spectrum, which is rare variation. So the rare variant genes that lead to heart failure are the ones we know very well. Titan, which I told you about in the first slide, uh, Lamin, RBM20, BAG3. BAG3 is interesting because it's one of the few genes that shows up on both sides of this list. And then of course, genes we know very well like MYH7 and MYBPC3, which are genes that are important for sarcomere function. The mutations in these genes can lead to different forms of cardiomyopathy. Um, these days, when we order a gene panel, um, we pretty typically order a very large gene panel. I know there have been some suggestion that maybe we should be looking at um, more selective panels, particularly in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But um, in many instances, when you order these gene panels, and quite frankly, the price is the same. So you might as well get as much information as you can. The downside of ordering a very large gene panel when you're assessing your patients is that you are more likely to get variants of uncertain significance. And there've been some pushback on this idea because um, some physicians and providers are not 
comfortable with variants of uncertain significance, and they also project onto their patients that the patients are uncomfortable with variant of uncertain significance. And I will say that's not my experience. Um, we're, we really don't have trouble talking to patients about variants of uncertain significance, and we just don't feel that it elicits that much anxiety in the patient. So we go for large panels when we can get them. So one of the genes I wanted to talk about first was Titan, TTN is the Titan gene. Um, Titan is the major gene that is responsible for inherited forms of dilated cardiomyopathy. And Titan, the protein itself, spans half the length of the sarcomere and, and serves as a, a stretch sensor, if you will, for the sarcomere itself. Um, what's really interesting about Titan is that what I'm only talking about right now is premature truncations in this very large gene, which is encoded by 360 different exons. So what's shown here is all the exons that make up Titan in blue. And if you do deep sequencing of the hearts, um, only a fraction, these middle exons are not really included in the gene very much. And then what's shown here are all the premature truncations that you see in large population databases. And then in this um, paper, which was from a group at Geisinger and Penn, in red is where their pathogenic mutations are. And so you get the sense that they do tend to fall a little bit towards this end of the gene, but they certainly also saw them in this end of the gene as well. And so from this, we know that Titan truncations are strongly enriched in dilated cardiomyopathy cohorts. But as I just mentioned, um, Titan truncations are also present in the general population. So on average, about 1% of the population has a Titan. So what that tells you is that not every single person who has a Titan truncation is going to go on to get cardiomyopathy or get heart failure, but it certainly does represent a pretty strong risk allele for that development. And you could make the argument that knowing whether you have a Titan truncation variant is actually quite critically important for your management over time. Uh, managing blood pressure, again, probably want to manage cholesterol better, but there's a number of things you would do knowing this information earlier in life. Um, what this has led to is the general concept that Titan truncations plus second hits are what lead the patient to actually manifest as having heart failure. And this was a nice review written by Diana Fatkin, um, which said that again, um, in DCM patients, it's you know one in whatever frequency you wanna use in the general population, but with second hits, you can develop dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and similarly, again, more of these second hits and even age being considered as a second hit, you can then go on to develop dilated cardiomyopathy. So worth considering and knowing this information because it represents a risk allele. Um, this was a great paper from um, the Penn group, again, that Geisinger Penn group, where they took a reverse approach. Instead of taking a whole bunch of people with cardiomyopathy or heart failure and then sequencing what their genes were, they instead said, what if we sequence a portion of the population and then we say, what clinical findings do we see associating with tight truncations? Uh, what phenotypes do we see associating with this genotype? And so in this case, the, uh, that, so the caveat here is these are, of course, are all people who are using the healthcare system and have medical diagnoses. Dominantly, what we see is the diagnosis associated with this were um, cardiomyopathies, having a de uh, defibrillator, paroxysmal ventricular tachycardia. But importantly, we also see things like atrial fibrillation. And what's a clear signal that's now been coming out from a number of papers is that um, it seems like atrial fibrillation is, a, is really increased risk for these patients. And that may in fact be some of the first or only presentation that we see associated with some of these genetic variants. So a different kind of approach, and it's relevant to ask this because as we think about genetic screening, this is how we'll be doing it. You'll offer genetic screening and then you'll have to counsel patients as to what their risk is over their lifetime. So that's this general concept, which is we're very good at going from a phenotype, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and saying, what is the genotype? But how do we begin to go from the genotype and ask what is the phenotype? And so for example, in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations, we may see everything from individuals who have a genotype for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but have a normal heart or have mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what are those additional risks? And I'll say right now, I think atrial fibrillation is one of those risks. So we're doing that through this program, which is called Emerge. This is the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Consortium. There are a number of participant sites um, that have been working together for 15. We're now in our 16th year of working on this. Um, 
over the stages of the eMERGE network, the first phase was doing genome-wide association studies and correlating that with things in the electronic health record. The second phase was very much focused on pharmacogenetics. And the third phase that was deep sequencing of a little over a hundred genes, um, including the medically actionable genes identified by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And now in this phase four, we're actually beginning to do polygenic risk scores for a number of common diseases. And we're hoping atrial fibrillation will be one of those. Um, this is just an example from phase three. This was a 58 year old, so a, a 50, 100 genes or so were sequenced in these patients. This was an individual who underwent that sequencing panel and was found to have an MYH7 pathogenic mutation, arginine 870 cis. And he was 58 years old when this result was returned to him. Um, this is a variant that is widely agreed upon. This is from a database where you can just look up what is the agreement about this. So every single site agreed that this was a pathogenic variant. So this was returned to this individual saying, you did the sequencing, you turned out to carry this pathogenic variant. Now, when we looked at what was in his medical record, it was quite striking because two years earlier, he had presented um, with a stroke, so left facial droop, um, and when his EKG, I'm showing you his EKG here, which showed that he in fact had uh, a flutter, fib, so kind of a coarse, coarse a flutter. He received thrombolysis, actually recovered completely, and then ultimately underwent an ablation for atrial fibrillation. So this is the ret retrospectoscope. I'm telling you what we found when we knew his genetics and looked back in his history. Um, this was what his echo showed. So he did have left ventricular hypertrophy with septal thickening. He had an enlarged left atrium. On his MRI, he had 1.4 centimeters septal thickness, so just barely making criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy if he were coming from a family with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which in effect he is because he carries a gene mutation associated with that. Um, he also had delayed enhancement as well as enlarged atria on his MRI. Um, his family history was really quite significant. So this is our gentleman who presented with a stroke at age 56, carries the MYH7. Um, his father died at 62 suddenly of a heart attack, and his grandmother had died at age 60 quite suddenly also. So if we were to guess, we would guess this individual, and this individual also carried that MYH7. And importantly, there are now two of his offspring who are in their 20s to 30s who are now eligible for testing and then appropriate risk reduction. And so with that, that's what we're doing now is, as we've returned a lot of those results across the eMERGE network, we have about 25,000 participants in the eMERGE network. So I just wanted to tell you about um, a little bit more of a story of what we've also been doing with the eMERGE network, which is to begin to look at ancestry as well as race in a biobank. So as I told you, a lot of the studies these days um, are disproportionately studying people of European ancestry. So that's what our genomic databases are full of, lots of um, European ancestry. And so what we did was whole genome sequencing on a little under 900 participants who were in our biobank. So New Gene is the name of our biobank and 886 individuals. But we equally divided this cohort so that it was approximately equal numbers of people of European ancestry, African ancestry, Hispanic ancestry, which is a very broad group, as well as a broad group of mixed ancestry. Uh, the mean age was pretty similar across the groups, like almost all our genetic studies. Um, we tend to do much better recruiting women into them as a pair, as composed, uh, not so many men in the study, but other than that, it was a pretty good mix of individuals. And then by doing whole genome sequencing on this group of individuals, the first question we ask is um, how many genetic variants per person are found? And so it's kind of average, you find about 5 million variants, but there's quite a range. And so for example, individuals of European ancestry have a little under 5 million variants when compared with the reference sequence. On the other hand, if you're of African ancestry, you have nearly 6 million variants per person. So a lot more variation per person if you are of African ancestry. Those of Hispanic ancestry, again, you see a, a more than in European and mixed represents that great big group. So as I told you before, we now use principal components to align these genetic variants and, and decide where people fall on these PC plots. So here's the two, two major principal components um, where we see individuals of European ancestry tightly cluster into this uh, small blue group of dots. 
On the other hand, if you are of Hispanic ancestry, we see that your PC curves look like this, that you actually spread a lot. And we actually probably are covering individuals of Asian ancestry here as well. Whereas those of African and mixed ancestry fall along this part of the PC plots. So quite different. And this again reflects the fact that not only are the variants different based on what your ancestry is, but there are many more of these variants when you especially are of African ancestry. And so that's critically important as we think about doing genetic testing in these groups of individuals. Um, we found again, this almost exact same distribution. If we align our distribution from our new gene cohort, which was collected here in Chicago, and we align it up against the thousand genomes, we actually do a pretty nice alignment with what is seen in the thousand genomes. So we can reflect almost the genomic diversity of the world right here with populations here in Chicago, reflecting again, the broad populations we have here in the United States. We did look at the medically actionable genes. So these are the genes that uh, have been decided you should return these results to participants. We found about 2% of the individuals in our biobank had pathogenic uh, variation that was considered medically actionable. Four of them had variants that were consistent with long QT syndrome. Um, and we had a number of individuals who also had genetic variation associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And when we look in their medical record, we see signs of that they may in fact carry this diagnosis, but um, this was not known to them that they carried that diagnosis. So it suggests that we are in fact underdiagnosing many of these cardiovascular disorders and perhaps disproportionately doing so in individuals of non-European background. So another area where we need to improve. So this was work from Tess Pottinger, a really talented graduate student who said, well, we know we have all this increased variation in individuals. Um, especially of African ancestry, um, but do the variants of uncertain significance actually change by race and ethnicity? And in fact, that answer is true. If you are of African ancestry, you are more likely to carry a variant of uncertain significance. Um, you are more likely to carry variants of uncertain significance in your medically actionable genes. And again, about half these genes are cancer genes and about half are cardiac genes you are also more likely to carry variants of uncertain significance in your cardiac genes. And so again, really speaks to that we have a lot more variation in our diverse cohorts and that's something we have to address. Um, we also found that there was a fair number of what were unreported variants so that we couldn't find in the databases yet. That also was increased across the spectrum in individuals of African backgrounds. And so it says that we need to do much deeper sequencing in those groups to begin to address all the variation that is out there. So, um, but what Tess really wanted to do is we know that within some of these, uh, among the pool of variants of uncertain significance, Many of them may be doing nothing at all, but some of them may actually be changing outcome over time. And so Tess came up with a very clever way of looking at trajectory probabilities, which correlate with change in left ventricular dimensions over time. And what she found, because remember these are individuals in a biobank, so we could look into those individuals and see people who had echocardiograms. And the answer was really quite striking. If you carried a variant of uncertain significance, one or more of these in your cardiac genes, you had a change in your left ventricular dimensions over time, different than individuals who did not carry that. So in other words, these hearts were dilating a little bit more over the time interval that we could look into the electronic record. So it suggests that some of these variants of uncertain significance are really driving changes in the background. And again, points to an area where we have to do um, better analyses to start to dissect these variants of uncertain significance. When Tess looked at what were the genes that were driving some of this change, um, this is normalized to the length of the gene as well. Um, the gene that really stood out from this analysis is carrying more of these variants turned out to be myosin binding protein C3. So this is not a gene that is unusually packed with variation. It is instead suggesting that the variation within this gene is more positioned to drive changes in left ventricular dimensions over time. So that's an important point. And again, another good target for us to be looking at as we think about um, options. So we know that MYBPC3, uh, which encodes the, the binding protein C3 of, of myosin, uh, 
Um, we know mutations in this gene cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly again, truncation variants are much easier to interpret for this, but there are a number of point mutants that also can do the same thing. And this is one of the major genes that we do testing for. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was a slightly different variant in the MYBPC3 gene that is really highly prevalent throughout South Asia. So this was discovered uh, 11 years ago, reported in Nature Genetics. This is a 25 base pair deletion that falls within an intron and carries a very significant odds ratio of almost seven for developing um, heart failure and cardiomyopathy within South Asian populations. So a powerful risk allele again. Um, what's really interesting about this um, MYBPC3 Delta 25, as it's known, is that it is found very heavily throughout South Asia, but it is also found throughout the world. And one of the questions was, does it correlate with risk? Um, or how is its effect mediated um, as it is seen in populations throughout the world? And so this was a collaboration that we did with Sakthi Sadiapan who is currently at the University of Cincinnati. And Sakti wanted to collect um, many patients of South, South Asian ancestry who are here in the United States, because this is a very rapidly growing group of um, uh, people in the United States, and to see whether he saw any correlations with those individuals having evidence for heart failure or cardiomyopathy. So getting at sort of a gene environment type interaction question. So just to be clear, this Delta 25, as it's known, is a deletion right here that falls between, um, this is a, again, fairly long gene, the last three exons of the gene, it positions itself right here at the end. And having this Delta 25 leads to variable splicing where sometimes this exon 33 gets skipped and then it hits a premature stop codon, thereby truncating the gene. But the splice forms that develop from this are, are a bit varied and so it doesn't completely eliminate it. There are individuals who can carry this most of the time heterozygously on one copy of their gene, but there are also individuals that can carry this homozygously. Um, so Sakti had collected a, a fairly large group of individuals. I think he's up to having about 3,000 people that he's connected with um, here in the US right now of South Asian descent. Um, and he genotyped them for the Delta 25, finding that about 6% of the individuals here in the United States carry the Delta 25. So fairly similar with what has been described. And worldwide, this is estimated to be almost 100 million gene carriers for this Delta 25. Um, there are a small percent that carry it homozygously, but most people carry it heterozygously. And he did echoes on this group of people comparing the Delta 25 carriers to the non-carriers, finding that um, they didn't really have a change in their E to E prime. There was a very slight shift upwards in the fractional shortening, as you can see here, perhaps driven a little bit by these individuals who are also homozygous. Um, and then just a little trend, but not as significant for LVEF. And here, what I'm showing you is an increase in function because one of the earliest findings associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is actually to have a hyperdynamic heart. And that hyperdynamic state is not necessarily considered a beneficial state. In fact, it's considered a pathogenic state. Um, we did broad sequencing on a group of these non-carriers of the Delta 25 and carriers of the Delta 25. And this is the same group of people that underwent echocardiography. And we asked whether they carried any additional genetic variants across their cardiomyopathy genes. Um, and the ones in red are the Delta 25s. And you can see by and large, there were a few different additional variants found in the Delta 25 carriers. But where we actually saw an increase in additional variants was in the MYBPC3 gene itself. And I'll show you in a second what that is. Um, what it turned out to be is that a group of these individuals with the Delta 25 had a second hit and it was on the same copy of the Delta 25 gene. And this hit is D389B. So it is a missense change that is sitting on myosin binding pro protein C3. Um, and it's in addition to the Delta 25. So that's shown here. If this is the gene, it's made up of its 34 exons. The Delta 25 falls right here in intron 32. This D389B is positioned in exon 12. And these are in fact on the same copy. Now where this D389B falls is in what's a C2 domain. There are multiple of these domains across the myosin binding protein C3. And D389B falls in this region right here 
that is known to interact with myosin itself and being a very important regulator of the myosin binding protein C3 and myosin interface directly regulating contractility. And this is where this falls, is right into that region. Um, the way we know it's carried on the same copy of the gene is that, first of all, we only ever saw it in the presence. Delta 25 and D389B were only ever seen with each other. We've never seen D389B separate from the Delta 25. But here's a lovely example where this is a mother who's carrying both the Delta 25 and the D389B. And you see that she's passed both of these to her offspring, which indicates that this is in fact on the same copy of the gene. So they are traveling in cis with each other. Um, when we looked at the subgroup of individuals, went back to the echo data that carried both the Delta 25 and the D389B, then we saw a much clearer distinction that these individuals had an increase in ejection fraction as well as an increase in fractional shortening. So again, reflecting that increased hyperdynamic state that is characteristic of early phase hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it really does identify that it's this group of individuals with the Delta 25 plus D389B that are more likely to carry that problem. So again, a subset of that group of 100 million people worldwide carry this additional change. This is just showing mapping of that C2 domain. Uh, this was some mapping that was done. This is the 3D structure of that. This is saying the D389B sits here on the external face of the molecule where it's very well positioned to be directly interacting with myosin heavy chain. And I know Sakthi has now engineered this into a number of different settings so that he is now studying the function of that D389B on its own. Um, but we were able to isolate um, and make induced pluripotent stem cells uh, and then generate cardiomyocytes from those. And these are ones carrying the Delta 25 as well as the D389B. And we were able to compare that. And the striking feature was the Delta 25 plus D389B generated larger cardiomyocytes. So there's two different of these Delta 25 plus D389. And in both cases, the cells cardiomyocytes generated from these were larger than the Delta 25 on its own or a control cell. Um, similarly, if you look at the calcium transient, transients in these cells, we saw many more irregular calcium transients, and that's quantified here, which suggests that these iPSCs differentiated into cardiomyocytes are reflecting, again, a, a pathological state that's associated with having Delta 25 and D389B and suggesting that there, in fact, is some of the same substrate that leads to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also present with these genetic variants. And so that's um, brought us to just the last little bit I wanna talk about, which is we have uh, recently done a study to look at comparing the genomic landscape of dilated cardiomyopathy with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we collected a cohort of about 120 patients 71 had dilated, 56 had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and these are just their echocardiographic parameters indicating that they did in fact have these diagnoses. And we conducted whole genome sequencing on these individuals to say, well, do they carry other genetic variants that help contribute to what is their outcome? And so this again, in this case, I'm doing a principal component analysis saying what separates the HCM and DCM cohorts. We know their diagnosis up front, what begins to separate them. So here's principal component one, principal component two, nicely separating these two things. And when we say what's contributing to principal component one, doing this dimensional reduction, what we see is that it is the number of non-synonymous variants, so SNPs that change, making missense changes in cardiomyopathy genes. So if you have more changes in your cardiomyopathy genes over time, you are more likely, or in your genome, I should say, you are more likely to have dilated cardiomyopathy than to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, really driven by these individuals out here who have a high number of variants and are more likely to express this dilated cardiomyopathy. So what I'm saying is if you have more variants in your cardiomyopathy genes, these are the types of things that might be called variants of uncertain significance, that's more likely to manifest as dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, uh, that's showing you here, your probability of having DCM goes up over time as you have more variants in your cardiomyopathy genes. 
what was quite striking about this result was it was not exclusively driven by the rare variants. It was in fact driven by even some of these high frequency variants that are up in this allele frequency where they're present in the general population. So if you have some of these more common variants on the backdrop of uh, additional genomic variation, you are more likely to manifest of, as dilated cardiomyopathy compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, there's a dose responsiveness to this, if you will. Those individuals who had the greatest number of variants per person in their cardiomyopathy genes had the worst ejection fraction. And similarly, as you might expect, those individuals that had the most number of variants were more likely to have the most dilated heart an increased left ventricular diameter corrected for body surface area. So again, a dose responsiveness of this result was seen. So I just, in the last minute, we'll come back to the case. So two cases that I talked about. This was a 56-year-old woman who got picked up through cascade screening because her daughter um, died and was found to have a tightened truncation. Um, this woman is in fact African-American and it is more difficult to interpret this, although we do consider this a likely pathogenic variant. Um, in fact, uh, there was some suggestion of that paper that I showed you from the Penn and Geisinger group that individuals who are of African-American ancestry who carry Titan truncations may not manifest as much as dilated cardiomyopathy. And I will say in our cohorts, we don't think that's true. We have plenty of people who are of non-European ancestry who have developed cardiomyopathy with these. Um, but it does make it complicated to do her interpretation, but we're, we are doing a full screening on her and hopefully we'll get some good information that her heart looks okay at this point in time. And then we can just talk about good management of her blood pressure and cholesterol and um, you know, Life Simple 7 to make sure she stays as healthy as possible and incorporate cardiovascular screening into her medical regimen going forward. This case um, is a 62 year old male um, this individual is in fact of European ancestry, which was part of why I told you his European ancestry frequency. What we know here, looking at RBM20 variants, and we map to where this falls, we actually know that this maps to a domain that's previously been published by uh, Perique et al. to be strongly enriched for pathogenic variants over the general population, taking advantage of the information that we have here, that we have richer databases for European ancestry individuals, and in particular domain knowledge on this protein that helps us actually tell this individual that we think this is likely pathogenic in him. And therefore we would recommend upgrading his pacemaker to be an ICD so that we could better manage his VT risk going forward. And so that information has been transmitted to his other physicians who are taking care of him. And so with that, I will conclude that um, genetic determinants of health really need to be considered in the context of genetic ancestry. And hopefully our databases are improving day by day so that we can do a better job with the diverse cohorts of individuals we all take care of. Um, genetic testing is very useful to identify individuals at risk for heart failure. And I think we will see this coming into the practice of medicine more with things that are known as wellness screens and different types of genetic testing, a lot of it being offered direct to consumer already at this point in time. I showed you some data that um, dilated cardiomyopathy appears to be more oligogenetic, oligogenic compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whereas having multiple variants makes you more likely to manifest as dilated cardiomyopathy. And hopefully I've convinced you that genomic context matters and larger genomic databases are needed to better serve our diverse populations. And so with that, the most important slide is all the great people who do this work. I want to really highlight the work of Tess Pottinger, who did all the work with the New Gene Biobank. This is Megan Pucklewartz, a very talented assistant professor I'm privileged to work with, who is uh, really our lead genomicist, along with Lorenzo Pesci, who is one of our computational biologists that we work with, and then the rest of my team and, and our collaborators. And with that, I will stop. There we go. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I was muted there. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. One of which is, have there been any um, uh, in vitro uh, uh, gene editing studies done on some of these uh, variants that you've described? 
Um, obviously, that's a very hot topic. Um, I think we're very aware we're living in the era where genetic correction is a reality to think about for our patients. And I think practically speaking, we now know what mutations are. We have a very good idea about how to fix them. And so we're really very much thinking about what are the tools to be able to do that. A big challenge for the genetic cardiomyopathies is that they are heterozygous diseases. So you have one normal copy and one abnormal copy. And so developing tools that let us precisely just work on the abnormal copy, we still have some technical work to do there. Um, but nonetheless, there's some targets that people are looking at. Um, the other field I work in a lot is neuromuscular disease. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is one that gets a lot of attention in particular because it's X-linked. We have only one copy of the gene that we have to fix on the X chromosome. Um, and reframing uh, deletions in dystrophin is, is a little bit easier than for some things. And so that's probably a frontline application at this point in time. Mm -hmm. A question from the audience, does, does, does the sarcopenia of aging occur in the myocardium? And if it does, um, uh, does exercise have any role in reducing that? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure we fully know that answer. You might consider that some of the changes in the heart that you see over time um, look a little bit similar to sarcopenia in aging. I, I think that's not an unreasonable way of thinking about it. Um, but we also know that there's a bit of increase in uh, a little bit of fibrosis content that increases over time. And that may be one of the differences between the heart and skeletal muscle. We don't quite see that fibrotic content, but very subtly there are some changes in fibrosis that occur in the heart over time. And that's been well described. Now, whether exercise is beneficial specifically for that, I would think probably yes. Uh, in general, we know that exercise is, is pretty good um, uh, for certainly for your skeletal muscle. And, you know, I will say helping your skeletal muscle definitely also helps your heart. So primary or secondary, oh, both work. <clears throat> you showed the association of uh, AFib with the uh, Titan truncations. And the, my question is, how, how do you know it's a primary association or that the truncation is causing some other problem with the left ventricle and the yeah. AFib is purely a, an innocent bystander reacting yeah. to some other problem? So I'm sorry, I didn't show all the um, papers that have come out on that lately, but there's quite a series of papers, um, some still coming out, some that have come out already that... Um, the younger you are, if you are one of these people who present early in life with what we call lone AFib, um, you actually have a pretty significant chance of having a cardiomyopathy mutation and um, much more likely to be a Titan truncation than any other variant. Um, and so what we know is those individuals can show up with AFib first before they have any problems with mm. their hearts. Um, and so I think that starts to be the argument for, I think we will see some changes in recommendation for screening over time, recommending genetic testing for individuals who show up with early onset AFib. Um, I know I follow a lot of people like this in my clinic, and if I know they carry a gene variant, again, I'm continuing to monitor their heart function. I'm managing their, I'm choosing the medications to manage them that will also make sure their blood pressure is really well controlled. And of course, reducing all their other cardiovascular risks along the way, because I view that individual as also being at risk for developing heart failure. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, it was uh, very nice to meet you. So thank you all for coming to Grand Rounds. Thanks, Beth. Good to see you. Let's really catch nice up. To see you. Yeah, talk later. All right, bye.